morning. All right, so um, we'll finish up the book by covering chapter nine uh, this week, and then we'll review on Monday for our last exam, a week from Wednesday on the last day of class. It's not a comprehensive exam, it's just over the last material we've covered since the, uh, the second exam. So the, uh, the, Last chapter is on plane waves. There are other types of waves, spherical waves, cylindrical waves, all types, combinations of those. Um, but we'll talk about, I will focus on plane waves in this chapter. And in particular, we'll, we'll focus on plane waves and lossless media. Um, we'll see that actually due to the coupling of between electric and magnetic waves, time varying waves, that it leads to propagation. We'll, we'll actually come up with a, a wave equation today, but just like you did for um, circuits, where you started out looking at DC sources. Uh, that's what we've kind of done so far to kind of work the DC problem. And then the next step was actually then to look at sinusoids. It seems like, a, you know, why pick a sinusoid out of all the other possible uh, available waveforms? Well, sinusoids are used in practice, certainly, but more importantly, through Fourier transforms, we can construct other waveforms through. Uh, from sinusoids. And so now what we're going to, so it's an important special case. So now I'm going to write our, I'll, I'll use the magnetic field here as, as an example. Um, it consists of for, for each of the vector components. This is A for amplitude. We can have a spatially varying amplitude, and then in the more general case will allow for phase angles to be different in, in each of the directions as well. But Sinusoidal variation uh, in time. Okay, so kind of emphasizing the, the, the time dependency here. We can simplify our notation by using phasers. That's not the only reason we, we use phasers. More importantly, is the work the phaser domain uh, simplifies the work with differential equations, but here in the Phaser representation e to the j theta x, and I'm dropping the position dependence here just for to simplify the notation plus y hat a y e to the j theta y plus a z plus z hat a z e to the j theta z. And then all e to the j omega t. So in these AXs, AYs, AZs um, uh, represent our amplitudes. The, the phase angle component here is, is uh, represented by our thetas. When we multiply the exponentials, we get e to the j omega t plus theta z, for example. The real part of that from this is RE for the real part of that expression. 
the real part of either the J omega T plus theta Z would be the cosine of that. So, and then one other notational simplification. I'm going to call the term in square brackets B with a capital B with a tilde over it. And I, uh, in the textbook, he has this as a bulk base B to indicate that it's a, a vector which I've been using a bar over the letter to indicate that it's a vector. Um, um, but I'm not going to write the bar and the tilde both. So the tilde indicates that it's actually a phaser. So it contains the amp. It's a complex number. Actually, it's more than that. It's a complex vector in this case. It has the X, Y, and Z components and when we express it in Cartesian coordinates, but it's also a complex number in each of those. And it may depend and generally will depend on position as well. So it's a position dependent complex vector. No time dependence though. We've, we've again, due to the assumption that it's sinusoidal, We've, we've pulled out the time dependence. Of course, the big advantage of, of phasor notation is if I look at the time derivative of my original B field, and this, this is a bar, not, not the phasor, and go back and take a, the time derivative I can write that using this notation, indicating that in the phasor domain, so the corresponding phasor, the, the phasor that corresponds to this time derivative then would be J omega times B tilde, the, 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 the phasor um, of B. Okay, so time differentiation in the phasor domain becomes just multiplication by, by J omega. So I think last time we ended and I wrote down Maxwell's equations. Now I want to write them down in, in corresponding phasor form. Del dot D is rho V. All of these have complex or tildes over them. So rho V now is, is a, may also be a complex number, may also be sinusoidally varying. Del cross E is minus J omega B. That was a minus a partial derivative of B with respect to T. And del dot B tilde is equal to zero. And del cross H tilde is J tilde plus J omega D tilde. So all the quantities in here are, are vector phasors except uh, rho V, where, where rho V is, is actually a, a regular phasor. It's not a vector because the divergence of the the divergence of a field gives us a scalar. So it's just the scalar. Now we still have the spatial derivatives. Okay, that's that's what the Bell operator does. So it takes a, a spatial derivatives to either the dot product or to either the divergence or the curl. But we've gotten rid of the time derivatives here and in uh, Maxwell's equations. We're going to start with even one more simplification. By looking at the source free case. So there is no free charge. There is no free current. So what I mean by that is in this source free region,
rho v is equal to zero and j is equal to zero. Okay. Now, there is one further impl implication that if we hope to find a non zero E, we must also have sigma equal to zero here. A lossless case since J is equal to sigma E. So if J is going to be zero, if we work with a non-zero conductivity, then E would have to be zero. The exception would be if the conductivity is also zero, then E could uh, E could be non-zero and we still have a zero J. So that you might think that, well, if I have no sources, I'm not going to have, uh, I'm not going to have any fields. There is a source somewhere. Okay. It's just we're working with the point form of Maxwell's equations. So just like uh, surrounding a sphere of charge, there was an E field, um, but there was no charge around the sphere. There was still an E field. And similarly for magnetic field, we had a magnetic field around a wire that contained a current density. Now the equations for this, the E field within the sphere or the magnetic field within the chart, uh, current carrying conductor were different because of the presence of sources, but we still had fields away from the sources. So um, we're asking now what happens uh, when the fields are, are sinusoidally varying. We'll do one more notational simplification with D equal to epsilon E. And this is certainly the case that we've looked at all semester, where we've assumed our material is isotropic and homogeneous, the same throughout. Doesn't depend on the direction you're looking, certainly in complex and a more elaborate concept, comprehensive treatment of electromagnetics, like you might encounter in graduate school. Epsilon here may actually be, uh, you know, a, a matrix to represent this uh, representation, could have, or more properly, I guess, a, a tensor, um, so that we could have actually uh, a different dependence uh, depending on the direction that, that we're looking. But for our cases, at least in our introductory study of electromagnetics, epsilon is the same throughout the material and doesn't have directionality. And the same is true for, for mu. We can then write Maxwell's equations, in source-free form, just in terms of E and H. minus j omega u h and del cross h is plus j omega epsilon e. So um, now we're down essentially to these four equations. And the two unknowns, E and H, they're differential, couple differential equations. They can be combined. So see the, the text for this. I'm not going to go through the derivation. It's not difficult, but it takes a little more time than I want to give it. As a matter of fact, you're going to, in one of the homework problems, uh, come up with this equation. But he, he, he derives it in the text for 
the E field and the homework you're asked to derive it for the H field, but the derivation is, is pretty much identical. And what you get is del squared E or the Laplacian of E plus there's, I'll define this constant in just a second, uh, beta squared is equal to zero and del squared H plus beta squared H is equal to zero. So you get two differential equations. This is actually a three dimensional wave equation um, for the phasor form. If you remember way back in chapter, I think it was one or two, we looked at the wave equation and one dimension. It was a partial derivative with respect to x squared minus one over c squared times the time derivative of the, the function, the second time derivative of the function on well, phasor form that becomes this. And these are coupled. They're also of the same form. Okay, so if we solve one, you know, if we solve the one for E, then H will differ only by from E by a you know, complex constant. Beta here is a new constant that becomes convenient to define when you when you come up with these corresponding wave equations. It's kind of nice. It it it, uh, it just includes all three of the other constants that are in the equation, the omega, the, the frequency of variation, and then the permeability and permittivity are, so instead of having all three of those in the, in the equation, we can conveniently combine, combine them into one constant. Um, these are wave equations and beta is the phase Propagation constant. Same, we use that same notation back in chapter one when we first talked about uh, uh, solutions to the wave equation in a, a single dimension. Um, And in the next series of the book, so there's a second volume to this book that's that's also free, which would be used in a, a second semester course. Uh, it actually starts with wave propagation and a, and a lossy media. So where the conductivity is, is actually not zero. And then there, um, we actually see that the uh, wave amplitudes uh, decrease. There's an exponential term that appears. And so the, the amplitudes fall off with distance due to the loss in, in the material. Um, but here in the, in the lossless case, we'll see that the, the amplitudes are are constant, or there's not a, a spatially dependent fall off in amplitude. Um, if, if you go back and look at your formula sheet uh, for both plus in, so now. You know, writing, expanding the E field and its coordinates. Again, each of these coordinates may be functions of X, Y, and Z also um, spatially dependent. Then, but the Laplacian in this case is just the Laplacian of each of these individual functions. These are not vectors. Uh, 
L squared E Y plus C hat L squared E Z. And the vector wave equation for E becomes del squared EX plus beta squared EX is equal to zero. We actually get three wave equations. squared E C equal to zero. And similarly for the magnetic field intensity H, we get a set of three wave equations. Okay, we're not going to look at the solutions of these today. We'll, we'll talk about them um, next time, but I, I do want to briefly talk about the different types of waves that we can encounter, and then uh, specifically mention the type that we'll focus upon. Okay. Um, so we identify different types of waves depending on the shape of surfaces of constant phase or their phase fronts. Or sometimes called wave fronts. So you're, you're familiar with this, you know. If you if you throw a, a rock into a pond, you'll see the the wave crest and propagate out from that rock in circles, right? And you can actually see the the peaks and valleys. Well, if you connect all the peak at peaks uh, at one particular radius from where the the rock entered. You know, it's a circle and then you'll you'll see those actually circles actually moving out and you'll see a, a succession of circles until they all die away well those are those are phase fronts you know the points that connect all the all the points of constant phase we typically you know, it's easiest to visualize the, the peaks and the troughs but it could actually be uh, any constant phase and Uh, with spherical waves, um, typically produced by a, a point source, but we'll often model wave fronts as spherical waves if our source is small compared to um, the distance at which we're intercepting the wave. So. So around our around our source here, again we've got we're talking about the source free region. Okay. These waves are actually propagating away from the source. So the arrows here are representing the direction of propagation of the wave and okay, we'll talk more about that but this this would be an example of a spherical wave and these are solutions to uh the wave equation in spherical coordinates
another type of wave are cylindrical waves that may arise from a, a line source where um, the wave fronts now are cylinders and again, you'd have a series of connectric concentric cylinders again these wave fronts are propagating out from the source cylindrically where the and the spherical waves are more like soap bubbles. And then the last type of wave that we'll focus on in this chapter are plane waves, and they can arise from either a planar source or actually a parabolic antenna. And so the, the plane waves I'm actually just showing a uh, this would be a section of a plane wave front where the waves are propagating and the wave fronts are propagating in that direction. So these are plane waves. Um, from a parabolic antenna, what you can have from a, a source, if here I, if I, if I actually plotted the the perpendiculars, the normals to the wave fronts. What you actually get from a parabolic antenna due to the shape of the antenna is when it comes off the, so it starts out, these are, these are spherical wave fronts, but the ones that are reflected off of the parabolic antenna are actually planar. It, so we can get you know, planar waves, constant wave fronts um, in front of a parabolic antenna. Um, more importantly, all waves can be modeled. as locally planar. When you're far enough from the source. So I'll just draw that this last picture right here. So even to take the case of a, a spherical waveform front at if you're uh, from the point of maybe a receive antenna that's being generated by a transmitting antenna that's creating spherical waves, that receive antenna is only going to pick that, intercept the small port a small part of that wave front. And so over this sphere, that, re that receive antenna, that large spherical wave front is going to appear as a planar wave. 
and um, that's very much like you know, um, it, it appears that the floor is flat. Well, the floor is hopefully flat, but you know that the the, uh, the Earth is flat because we're on the surface of a very large sphere, and we are on the surface of a very large sphere. Um, but locally, you know, uh, sections of, of the Earth appear to be flat because we can just intercept or see such a small portion of this much larger sphere. And the same is true for you know, receive antennas. So to a good approximate, to a very good approximation, we can model the locally received wave front, whether it's spherical or cylindrical as, as a planar wave. And so that's why the study of planar waves is, is very important. Um, it's actually the, the conclusion of this section. I didn't want to start the next section because they couldn't get through it. So I'm gonna let you go a little early today and we'll pick up with discussion of planar waves on Wednesday. Okay. We'll finish up this chapter actually on, on Friday. So hang in there, we're almost done.